you can also do it by weighing the evidence. I want to tell you very briefly about two very smart guys. Here's the first one. His name is Robert Dick Wilson. Uh, he was a professor of Semitic philology of Princeton Theological Seminary in the United States of America. Uh, Semitic philology sounds very important. Uh, you don't have to understand it, it's just very important. Uh, and uh, he was an armchair scholar. He read up the past. He divided his academic life into three periods of equal periods of 15 years. The first 15 years, he was going to learn every language related remotely to the Old Testament. The second 15 years, he was going to read all the documents that were available, and in the third 15 years, he was going to publish. So he started. He set out to learn a few languages. He learned, just as a sort of starting point, he learned German and Italian and Portuguese and Spanish and French and he went on to learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic and then he added Babylonian, Ethiopian, uh, Phoenician, Syriac and then concluded with Egyptian, Armenian, Persian, Coptic and a few more. As a matter of fact in the end he learned 26 languages and dialects. How's your French getting on? Then he spent 15 years using those languages to study all available material linked with the Bible. And then 15 years publishing his results. His conclusion? I try to give my students such an intelligent faith in the Old Testament scripture that they will never doubt them as long as they live. And he said no man knows enough to assail the truthfulness of the Old Testament. The other man is Sir William Ramsey. Very different from Robert Dick Wilson. Dick Wilson was brought up to believe the Bible. This man was brought up not to believe the Bible. Sir William Ramsey was what I call a bucket and spade scholar. Whereas the other one read up the past, this one dug up the past. He was uh, quite a bright guy as it happens. He was professor at Oxford and Aberdeen universities, gained three honorary fellowships from Oxford, nine honorary doctorates from British Continental and American universities, gained the Victorian Medal of the Royal Geographic Society in 1906, was a founder member of the British Academy, and was knighted in 1906 for his service to archaeology. And there were a few other things, but they wouldn't fit on the screen. And he spent a lifetime digging up Asia Minor. These were the lands of the Apostle Paul. He was told to believe that Luke, the writer of the, gospel, of the Gospel and also the Acts of the Apostles, would be completely in error in most of his facts. And he dug up the lands of the Apostle Paul's travels and Luke's record in the Acts of the Apostles and he came to this conclusion. He said, you may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond that of any other historians and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. Christianity did not originate in a lie and we can and ought to demonstrate this as well as believe it. The evidence convinced him. I want to give just two illustrations of the past. I want to tell you first of all about a king who never existed. That doesn't look as though it's going to go very far, does it? A king who never existed. You see, until 1843, the only reference in known history to a king called Sargon was in one verse of the Bible, Isaiah 20 and verse 1. And so it was assumed, quite seriously, that no such person ever existed. It was simply a make-up, a name, out of random. Then, in that year, 1843, Paul Bota was digging around in Khorsabad, 15 miles north of Nineveh in modern-day Iraq, and he discovered the remains of a temple and a library belonging to an ancient king of Assyria called Guess Who. <laughs> Nobody ever denies him today. I can take you and show you this in the British Museum. Uh, he's now one of the best-known kings of the ancient world. Guarding his palace, he had two of these massive 15 feet high, 10 ton human headed winged bulls. That's not bad, is it, for a king who never existed to build a 15 foot high, 10 ton human headed winged bull and a pair of them as well. And then I want to tell you briefly about an order that never, was never given. Luke 2. You know what happened in Luke 2, don't you? It was long assumed that a Roman emperor would never issue an order for a census as described in Luke 2, where every man went to his town to register. What a load of nonsense. No, no Roman emperor is going to ask people to do that. 
Oh, really? Well, that's what they thought until this papyrus decree was discovered in Egypt, which is an order for a Roman census in Egypt at the time of Trajan in AD 104, which mirrors the order of Augustus in Luke 2 almost exactly. And the prefect Gaius Maximus orders all those in his area to, guess what, return to their own homes for the purpose of a census. But let me just underscore this fact. We do not believe the Bible is true because of this. We do not believe the Bible is true because archaeologists have proved it. We believe the Bible is true because of far stronger and more certain evidence. It claims to be and is what it claims to be.